five. Continue the uh, Sierra Bravo Ultra of Charlie Eleven. Sierra Bravo for the Charlie Eleven. Hello YouTube, Captain Mac here, and as the title suggests, this is going to be your FMC tutorial for the PMDG NGX737. Has a whole lot of letters and acronyms in there. Well, what we're going to be talking about today, obviously, is operation of the FMC, or the Flight Management Computer, uh, specifically relating to ground operations. What I mean by that is we're not going to actually go up in the air and do anything today, and there's a lot of different things you can do in the air that will be a different tutorial we're going to talk about setting things up on the ground including setting up your flight plan selecting your uh, your SIDS or your standard instrument departures uh, checking your route inserting waypoints all of that good stuff uh, that's what we're going to cover here today uh, what we will not cover on the ground is anything related to the PMDG setup here or the FS actions here that's going to have to be a completely different tutorial because there's so much information in there and I already talked for so long as it is that there's just no way we're going to be able to get through all of that in a reasonably timed video and I try to keep my tutorials a little shorter as my life of virtual airline pilot series tends to get pretty long alright so let's clarify a couple of things here really quick let's hop up here you've heard the terms FMC, FMS and CDU and there's either confusion or debate or argument over uh, what that is. Okay, so let's clarify that really quick. FMC means Flight Management Computer, FMS means Flight Management System, and CDU means either Computer Display Unit or Control Display Unit, and it can be used interchangeably as far as I know. If you know otherwise, please feel free to correct me down in the comments. You won't hurt my feelings too bad. That being said, FMC is typically associated with Boeing aircraft, and FMS is typically associated with Airbus and some other aircraft out there. Now, I could also be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure I'm on the right track there. What is an FMC? It is the Flight Management Computer. All right? It's not this guy right here. It's this guy, this guy, all of our displays. It's our um, MCP, which is our... Uh, uh, what is it? MCP is Management Control Panel? I, uh, my brain's not functioning properly today. It never seems to function right when I'm actually recording a video. Anyway, the point being, of course, that the flight management computer is the computer that controls everything for flight management. It's not just this right here. The same could be say, said for the flight management system. It is the system that controls the management of the flight. The CDU, or Control Display Unit, is this guy right here. Now a lot of people get in an uproar if you call this thing an FMC. Me personally, I don't have an issue with that. It's part of the FMC, so who cares if we call it the FMC. This is how we predominantly interact with the FMC with the exception of our autopilot functions up here. Most of our interaction with the FMC directly is done through the CDU. So I'll use the terms interchangeably throughout this tutorial. I'll call it an FMC and a CDU. And, uh, you know, if you want to beat me up in the comments, that's fine. It's uh, not going to bother me. So, all that being said, let's start talking about some ground operations with our FMC here. Before we can really do anything of great use, at least for setting up a flight, we need to make sure that our IRS is aligned. And we do that by going to the upper portion of the overhead panel, all the way up top here. Okay. And I'm going to, you know what, I, I think I messed this up. So, in order to... I, I messed it up because I tried to do this once before and, and I left it sitting there. <laughs> in order to align the IRS, we need to right click these two knobs twice to set them to nav. The on DC light should come on and after a few seconds it will go off and the align light will come on. When the align light comes on, we'll left click them each once to the align mode and then we'll go into our FMC to complete the process. So let's right click them twice. They both come on DC and you'll see them both go to a line here and then we left click them once to put them in a line mode and now we can use our FMC to complete the process of alignment so let's hop on in remember we're not going to be messing with these functions today we're strictly going to be going to be dealing with ground operations on the FMC so we'll go in here and the first thing we need to do is let's see uh, I don't know why it went to that page normally it'll come to this page first uh, your initial uh, position initialization page. Uh, this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, 
I've seen some tutorials on these before and I've heard people call this the pause in it page. It is not the pause in it page, it is the position initialization page. You just can't fit all that on there. So for me, I'm going to call it the position initialization page and so on. Now you can see it's telling us to enter our IR enter our IRS position and we do that you can see we're on page one of four we do that by clicking to the next page grab either one of these GPS coordinates here by just clicking the button next to them and I'll talk about these here in a second and you can see it puts that same coordinate down here in the scratch pad and we go back to the first page we're on page two of four go back to the first page by hitting previous page and then we're gonna click this button here and it puts that in there for us. And now the IRS can finish its alignment process. That is step one to getting anything really uh, useful done with the FMC. So while it's finishing up its alignment, and uh, just so you know, you can change using these settings here in PMDG setup, you can change how fast it aligns. Realistic time is 10 minutes. It's not going to take that long today. I got it set to do it faster, but we can go ahead and take care of other things and allow it to finish its alignment right now. That being said, let's talk about this unit here really quick. These buttons here are called line select keys. All right, there's six per side, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm about to cough here. <coughs> I may or may not edit that out. <laughs> uh, so these are the left line select keys. These are the right line select keys, and they go in order from top to bottom. So this is left line select key one, left line select key two, and so on and so forth. I am not going to call them left line select key one and two and right line select key three and four and so on throughout this tutorial because I talk too much as it is. And that's a mouthful to say every time. I'm going to call it what it is. It is a button. Just note that when I am pressing or, or calling these a button, if you're not sure which one I'm pressing, just count one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, any questions about that? Hopefully not, I think we're probably good to go. Now if we look over here, we can see that our IRS is not aligned yet because we have nothing on here. But we've got an error for our map and an error for our attitude. Okay, not the not like our attitude, like a chip on our shoulder, but our attitude as far as the reference of the aircraft horizontally to the ground. Did I confuse anybody yet? Hopefully not. Okay, we have those errors because the IRS is not aligned. This aircraft needs the IRS aligned to fly properly, and the FMC must have IRS alignment on at least one IRS in order to be able to function properly. Now. While we're waiting for our IRS to finish its alignment, and there is one more thing we need to do to finish that, let's talk about the rest of this real quick. You've got your initial reference page here, and when we click on that, we get nothing at the moment. Why? Because there's nothing to reference. We're still doing our position initialization. This is your route key here. By clicking on this, it'll take you the same place as it will to click this button. This is for our climb phase, our cruise phase, our descent phase. Those are all individual pages that we can look at later on. This menu will take us back to this page right here, in case you didn't notice we're looking at the right screen at the moment. By pressing menu it'll take me back to here. I can press menu at any time anywhere within the FMC and it will take me back to this page. The legs page we'll be talking about shortly. Departure and arrival is SIDS and STARS. Holds, progress, N1 limit, I've never used it. Fix, previous page, next page, and then obviously we have our entire alphabet along with a space function, delete function, slash key, a clear key, and then all of our numbers, plus and minus sign, at a period, and an execute key. That's a whole lot of information on there. Instead of sitting here trying to explain what each button does individually, I'm going to explain them as I get to them, because you'll see what they're doing when we get to each phase within our operation of the FMC here. Now let's hop back up to our upper overhead panel here. Now after we after we believe the alignment is complete, we've put that GPS coordinate into the FMC, we should be able to click these one time, right click once, over to nav. There we go, we get some numbers up here and when we hop down here, hey look at that, our displays are working properly now. Fantastic, IRS is aligned and we are ready to rock and roll. So let's talk about the next step in our initialization. Uh, let's go back here. So to get where we want to go next, we were on our initial our position initialization page. I clicked initialization uh, reference page, and that took us back here. If I click on this button here, route, now it's going to ask us to set up our route. Now there's two different ways essentially to do this, and I'm going to show you both of them. I have already pre-planned a route 
from Phoenix Sky Harbor to JFK. So let's start by doing that. I'm sorry, not Phoenix Sky Harbor, we're at Goodyear. I went to Goodyear so there's less traffic. So we want to type in our origin airport by using the keypad down below here, and that's KGYR. That's that's Goodyear Airport. And then we'll click the button next to origin and it puts it in there for us. And you can see then the runway option pops up. And we haven't chosen a runway yet, so we don't need to put anything in there. Now let's put in our destination. We're going to JFK. And the, this is not a real world flight. The only reason I chose this is so there's lots of waypoints in there. So I can show you the advantage of using an, uh, a flight planning tool that saves flight plans in the, in the uh, PMDG format. We'll get to that in a minute. So we, we put this, uh, we put our destination airport down here, KJFK, click the button next to destination, and there we go. Now, technically, we could fly a direct route by just having those two, uh, by having the origin and destination in there. However, we don't want to do that. We can put in a flight number here if we want. It doesn't matter what number you put in. Um, if you like to have your specific flight number in there, by all means, type it in, click on flight number. We're not choosing a runway yet, we'll get to that later on. So how do we enter our route? If I click the next page function, you can see this is page one of two. If I click the next page function, that takes me to the route section where I can put in my individual waypoints. And you can see there is a via and a to function here. All right. So let's say, and, and I'm just uh, on my other screen here, I've got my route pulled up. So it the route that I created is using the Lalu, Lalu's, Lalu's three departure to SJN and then direct to CIM and then so on. So let's forget about the departure right now. We can put the SID in later. I'll show you how to do that. Let's just go with that first waypoint. Let's say we're going to go directly to it. So we don't need to type in direct over here. I can just type the waypoint here and it's SJN. So if I type S, got to find it, JN, it puts it in the scratch pad, and then I click the button or the line select key next to where I want to insert that waypoint. And you can see it made it direct for me. Now, from there, I'm going direct to CIM. And in case you're wondering, these are VORs, and then waypoints typically have four or more characters in them. But we're going to go direct to CIM, so let's type CIM and we'll, we'll select it as the next waypoint by pressing the button or line select key next to the empty slot. Now, here we have several different options available to us, and this is important that we understand which one is which. Now, the sound's gonna go silent here for a minute because I just wanna double check and make sure I get this right. So when the sound goes silent, that's just me switching to my other screen here. You should still be able to hear me talking, but I just wanna double check, CIM is the Cimarron uh, VOR and it is 116.40 all right I've got that on my flight plan on the other screen here so when we look on here 116.40 is the Cimarron VOR so that's the one we want you can see that this one is an ILS and this one is an ILS DME so knowing that CIM was a VOR I could have just chosen this one because I know it's not an ILS or an ILS DME that I need to worry about but we always sometimes believe it or not sometimes you can get a full page or two or three pages of options on here so you want to make sure you choose the right one typically but not always the first option is the one closest to you however that being said what if this is waypoint number 40 into my flight plan well if it if the first one is the one closest to me it's probably not the one I'm looking for then all that being said what you can also do especially if you use uh, something like sky vector to plan your route Sky Vector will give you GPS coordinates for each of those waypoints, and you could use those to find them as well. I'm not going to harp on that too long. There is a little more uh, depth that goes into that, but understand that you need to make sure you're choosing the right waypoint for your route when you have options available. And to choose it, you simply click, click the button or the line select key to the left of the option you want. So we'll choose that one, and that puts us at SIM. And that was a whole lot of talking for that, but trust me, it was probably worth it. Now. From SIM to GCK, GCK being the next VOR, we're actually going to fly on an airway. And that airway or jetway is J96. So if I type J96 and choose this over here, it, it tells me, okay, first of all, it puts it, puts it in there. That makes sense. <laughs> but uh, what it does is it creates these boxes over here. These boxes mean that I must enter information there. 
dash lines I don't have to boxes I must so since I chose J uh, J96 or Jetway 96 from CIM I must put in what waypoint I'm going to here's why even though we're going to GCK there could be other VORs along J96 all right and when I do my advanced flight planning uh, tutorial I'll try to remember to explain that to you so we're gonna go to GCK next so we can go ahead and type G C K and we can click and there we go now next we're gonna take Jetway 18 or J18 so let's choose J18 now that's taking us to SLN Sierra Lima November however just for the heck of it let's type in SL M and let's see what it does nothing it's an invalid entry okay, and I did uh, obviously I did that on purpose the point I want to make here is that if you are typing in an incorrect uh, waypoint it's not going to allow you to put it in there now if somewhere along J18 was a VOR with the uh, with the abbreviation of SLM Sierra Lima Mike then it would put that in here the problem being of course if that VOR is a long way from SLN or Sierra Lima November then you're gonna end up pretty far off route so we want to make sure that we enter the proper waypoints now to clear this off all we have to do is hit the clear button you can see SLM is still there if I hit clear one more time it gets rid of the first the last letter and I can change that to an N and put it in there and now we're good to go and this goes on for a little while now this is this is the short the short version of putting it in using these airways and connecting your uh, waypoints like that and then we could activate that route by pressing the activate key however we're not going to do that if you have a tool such as PFPX or Avalosoft EFB or something like that that will or even an, uh, there's some online tools there's plenty of flight planning tools out there if you have a flight planner that allows you to export a flight plan in the format required by PMDG to be able to uh, it, uh, save it as a company route then you want to take advantage of that especially for longer flights okay and in order to do that well if if you if you need to know where to put that at let me know and I'll I'll tell you how to route to the folder but in the meantime if we go back to our first route page here when we put in our origin and our destination we put in our flight number and instead of going to page 2 if I click to the left of company route that's not co route it's company route it's going to bring up all of the company routes that are loaded in the FMC now I I want to clarify a point here because I've actually heard uh, some questions about this on some forums and stuff like that. In the real 737, does this option exist? Yes, it does. They store routes inside the flight management computer, and you can access them in a very in almost identical manner. Typically, their route names are a little bit different than the format that we tend to see in here. But nonetheless, we're going to JFK. This is the route I created, KGYR to KJFK01. So if I click the button or the line select key next to it, it highlights it, and then I click execute. And now you can see there's three pages here. Why are there three pages? Because all of those waypoints have been put in there. Now if I go to next page, you can see we had already put in SJN and CIM. If we hadn't put anything in there, it would have put them in there for us. And then you can see that it put in, in fact, we went all the way to SLN. The next was direct to BDF. And if we go to the next page, it's direct to OXI, DJB, SLT, LVZ, and then Lendy 6 is the expected arrival. Now, we could change that, uh, and we probably would, and I'll explain arrivals here in a few minutes. Now, all of that being said, all of our waypoints are entered in there. We need to activate our route. Even though we executed, the execute was just to put the route in there. Now we need to activate it. So we click the line select key or click the button next to it and then execute again. And now that route is in there and you can see we have a new option here. Now I've heard people call this the perf init page. It is not a perf init page. It is the performance initialization page. And, and I'm not trying to bad mouth those folks. I understand. It says perf init. Some people say it just because that's what it says and they know that it means performance initialization and some people probably say it because they don't know what it actually means it's the performance initialization page and we're going to click the button next to it 
and there we go here's our performance initialization and you can see that we've got our gross weight our our plan uh, fuel here zero fuel weight reserves re reserves is for reserve fuel ZFW is zero fuel weight the cost index and the cruise altitude let's go over these really quick first of all cost index I'm gonna start from the bottom because this is the way I usually do this the cost index is a number between 0 and 99 that determines essentially how how efficient the air the aircraft or in this case the flight management computer is going to fly the aircraft specifically we're talking about how much are we going to burn as far as fuel and stuff like that is concerned every uh, most airlines out there as far as I know have a what what they call a company index that is the cost index that they expect their pilots to fly with um, unless there are mitigating circumstances that being said I've flown with some airlines that don't they expect their pilots to figure it out on their own and the same can be said for virtual airlines some virtual airlines may have a cost index they want you to fly at most of them probably will not the virtual airlines that I fly for do not have a set cost index so if I want to get there fast I'm gonna put the number closer to 99 if I'm not in a big hurry I'm gonna put the number closer to zero for simplicity today we're gonna to go with 50 so type 50 down here click the button next to it and there's our cost index now what about reserve fuel the reserve fuel that you're required to carry is the um, is enough fuel to fly for an additional 45 minutes beyond your your uh, destination airport I believe that's correct 45 minutes I know for general aviation is 45 minutes at night and I think 30 minutes during the day not 100% certain on uh, commercial aviation that being said either way we're still going to need enough fuel to fly beyond our arrival airport and the reason for that is in case we get put in a hold or something like that there's also what we call uh, so that would be our final reserve we also have fuel that we need for our alternate airport that's not included in our reserves that should have been included in our flight plan so for our flight plan our final reserve according to our flight plan to have an additional 30 minutes of endurance is 2,165 pounds we're gonna need a little more than that because we want to go 45 minutes so we're, let's just say 3,000 pounds just for a number right now so I can just type the number 3 and click on it and, and 3.0 is 3,000 pounds now zero fuel weight what is zero fuel weight that is the weight of the aircraft with everything in it including unusable fuel unusable fuel there is some fuel in the tanks that doesn't get used so everything in the aircraft including unusable fuel all of the passengers all of their cargo all of that is zero fuel weight it's the weight of the aircraft without the fuel that you're going to use for the flight how do we calculate that well you can calculate it but it's going to take a lot of work you have to estimate uh, a certain weight for male passengers a certain weight for female passengers and so on and it, and it could take a little while uh, and we're not going to do that on here right now what we're going to do instead is we're going to use this handy little function that PMDG is built in here if we click once on the key next to zero fuel weight you can see that it put a number down here 107.1 107,000 pounds 107,100 pounds and then we're going to click again next to zero fuel weight and it puts that number in there for us and then automatically populates our gross weight based on the fuel that we have in there and so on and so forth all right next we need to consider our cruise altitude now it's going to depend on what we scheduled the flight to fly at so for example if we had scheduled this flight to fly at 40,000 feet we need to understand that right now this is our max altitude now we're going to burn a lot of fuel on takeoff and climb so this this number is going to go up relatively quickly and realistically we could probably go straight to 38,000 feet on departure and then do a step climb a few hundred miles from Goodyear what we're going to do is we're going to put flight level 380 in there I don't need to type FL and I don't have to type out 38,000 I can just type 380 and the computer knows that's flight level 380 and it puts it in there just like that now it wants me to execute it because it has to do with the overall flight planning the performance and the fuel calculation so we're going to click execute and now we're good to go we're done there if we know what our cruise wind is expected to be and this is an average this is not a complete cruise wind because it changes we're flying you know several thousand miles here uh, from uh, Goodyear over to I'm, I'm just looking over at my flight plan here it's uh, almost 2,000 miles the winds gonna change at our cruise altitude between here and JFK 
So we would we could put an average in there if we wanted, but we don't necessarily need to. You can also see that there's another page here. If we click on next page, you can see that there's a bunch of other numbers here. This is not something that we can make changes to. This is just information for us if we want to take a look at that. Go back to this page. You can see that we are done here at this point. And it's given us some other information. Sorry, I, just, I had a complete brain fart there. It's given us a little other information. Our top of climb outside air temperature is expected to be minus 56 Celsius or minus 69 Fahrenheit and so on and so forth. And we, we can use those numbers for some other for some other calculations and stuff, but this computer is going to do most of that for us. And this is not really about getting that quite that in depth. This video is already going to be long. There's nothing I can do about that. So let's go ahead and move forward to our N1 limit. Our N1 limit is what we want the aircraft, or the, in this case the FMC, to use as the limits on the N1, that is essentially the thrust of the aircraft, this is N1 here, what is the limit that we want the aircraft to apply to our N1 for takeoff, TO, and for our climb. Many of you may, are, may be familiar with flying PMDG shortly after takeoff, the uh, dependent on uh, depending on what altitude you put in there, the um, the N1 or the thrust reduces for uh, for the climb, all right? And uh, if you fly Airbus, you pull the throttles back to climb mode, it does the same exact thing. What are we talking about here? Well, if we leave it here on takeoff, uh, this one you can see it says 24K. F now, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be, but if I'm not mistaken, that's 24,000 pounds of thrust Okay, takeoff one is 22,000 pounds of thrust, it is a D rate. Takeoff two is 20,000 pounds of thrust, that's an additional D rate. And then 20, uh, takeoff B, or bump, is actually additional takeoff, uh, takeoff thrust at 26,000 pounds. Does that make sense to everybody? So if I want to do a D rated takeoff, like I have, let's say I have uh, a light load and I'm not flying very far and I've got a long runway that I'm taking off on. Why well, burn up extra fuel on the takeoff when I can do a derated takeoff? I would select that and the same could be said for a climb. And it's basically what it does is it alters how much thrust the aircraft is going to use during the climb. Typically, most of us will probably just leave it set right where it's at and that's fine. If you're doing a departure from somewhere like John Wayne Airport, you're going to have to do a bump takeoff maximum thrust and a derated climb probably a climb too and then you're gonna have to change the altitude at which that takes place and we'll look at that here shortly so let's go ahead and move on to the takeoff page here we are we can see there's uh, some information we have to enter some information we cannot enter some information we could calculate if we chose to and so on and so forth first thing we're gonna do is put our flap setting in there now if we look over here at our flaps Takeoff settings for flaps are 5, 10, and 15. All right, 10 is your typical takeoff setting. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody ever uses 5. 15 would be a short field takeoff. In other words, I don't have a lot of runway to work with. I need extra lift. And then 10, as far as I know, is pretty much your average takeoff flap setting. So we're going to type in 10 here. And we're going to click the button or the line select key next to flaps. And there you go, 10 degrees flaps. Now some of you may know this trick already, some of you may not. If you click next to where it says CG, that stands for center of gravity. If you click once, we get a number down here just like we did when we did zero fuel weight. And if we click again, it's gonna put that number right here and then it's gonna tell us how much nose up trim we should apply to the aircraft for the takeoff. That being said, this number could change depending on the runway we're using. If we're using a shorter runway, it may need more trim. If we're using a longer runway, it may need less trim. Something to keep in mind. So typically, I don't do my center of gravity until after I've chosen my departure. Now, if you feel like it, and this is a lot of work, but if you really want to get in depth, you can give this a shot. The center of gravity can be calculated. The calculation for center of gravity is uh, weight times arm equals moment. And some of you are going, what on earth did you just say? Okay, the weight is obvious, the weight of something, multiplied by the arm. What's the arm? The arm is the distance that that weight is placed from a given reference point on the aircraft. It's called the reference datum. Whose head hurts so far? Don't worry, I won't take too long on this. So 
the weight times the arm, that distance, let's let's just say let's say it's five feet. It's times that distance in inches uh, equals the moment. What is the moment? It is the it is the moment of inertia. That's what it that's what it stands for. Moment of inertia. So the weight times the arm equals the moment of inertia. When you take all of your weights, multiply them by their individual arms, and then you take and you add all those up. You add up your weights and you add up your moments and then you divide your moments by your your total moment by your total weight and you get your center of gravity who's confused raise your hand if you're confused oh wait I can't see you never mind nice thing is you don't have to worry about that in here I do not know if the real aircraft calculates center of gravity for you it may that being said typically at this point once I have that number in there, I'll go down here and I will adjust my trim to whatever it says by simply scrolling my mouse wheel so that I don't forget to do it. Of course, I would have already chosen my departure, and let's, let's find out if it changes. Just remember 5.25. Now, we need to choose our departure. We can click this button to do it, or we can choose departure and arrival. I want to choose departure and arrival so that I can show you there are three options here. We've got our KGYR is where we're at, we've got departure, and then we've got our arrival at KGYR and our arrival at KJFK. Why? Okay, the reason we have an arrival at KGYR or Goodyear is because if we haven't been in the air that long and the best airport for us to go back to, whether it be for an emergency or whatever, is Goodyear, we can immediately select an arrival for that airport. After we get a certain distance, I'm pretty sure it's after we go halfway, that should go away. That option for an arrival at Goodyear should go away, and we should only have the option of an arrival at JFK. We're not going to be doing an arrival right now. Let's worry about our departure. So by selecting the key next to departure, we can see we get two options or uh, two sides to work with here. First of all, we've got our available runways. There is only one runway at Goodyear, and that is runway 3 and 21. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, that's two runways. <laughs> okay, for those of you who are concerned that I said there's only run one, one runway, it is runway 3 going in one direction, it is runway 21 going in the other direction, but it is still only one runway. Now, we should have determined what our wind is. Okay, that's part of our flight planning. And based on the wind, we should be taking runway 3 because the wind right now is uh, 038 at 6 knots. Right? Okay, so choose runway 3. When I do that, if any of these departures are not are not available for runway 3, they should disappear. That doesn't always happen. So make sure and and when I get to my some of my advanced flight planning tutorials, I'll try to cover SIDS a little more in depth, but make sure that the standard instrument departure you're choosing is applicable to your route. Now, how can we go about doing that? Watch this. If I click on this guy here, I wanted to move it. Actually, let's do this. Let's go up here. Okay. I'm going to change this, the nav display, to plan by rotating this knob over to PLN plan. Okay. And then I'm going to pop it up here. And I'm going to pop this guy up here so that I can show you what we're going to do here. All right. If I need to zoom out, I can do that by rotating this knob here. It zooms out. And you can see right now it's sitting on SJN. That's all right. We're going to go ahead and just for the moment we're going to pick Bernard 3 SID. We are not going to transition at Tucson. Okay? And then we're going to hit execute. And that is put it in there. Now let's go to that page we were talking about earlier, the legs page. <coughs> By clicking on legs, you can see a, a few things here. First of all, we see what legs we're going to be flying. And we can go all the way through. And these are all our legs all the way up until LVZ, which is not JFK because we haven't chosen our arrival yet. We also see some interesting things in here. First of all, we see vectors. What are vectors? This is the computer assuming that air traffic control is going to be giving us heading assignments as we depart. So rather than putting in a specific waypoint, it puts in vectors, right? And if you if you don't do certain things, when we talk about um, when we do our tutorial about in-flight stuff, we'll start with a departure. We'll do a takeoff, and I'll show you what you have to do to get from vectors to Bernard. That being said, if we don't want to mess with that, you can click on Bernard. It puts it right down here in the scratch pad, and then I can click next to vectors, and you can see it basically just got rid of vectors and put Bernard in there. Hit execute, and now vectors are gone. 
Now, we're centered on Bernard right now. That's what this means, center. And we can step through each waypoint by clicking the step key. And now we're looking centered on TFD. And if we click it again, it's going to bypass this and go straight to SJN. Well, how far is that gap? We don't know. Let's zoom out a little bit. A lot of it. And you can see that SJN is quite a ways from TFD. This is a route discontinuity. We can replace this easily enough by either adding a different waypoint in there if we want, or we can simply click on SJN, click next to the empty boxes, and we're good to go. Hit execute, and now you can see our route is connected. And I know I'm kind of going a little quick here. I, I take so long on these things sometimes. So if we zoom back down here, we can see that from KGYR, we're going to take the Bernard departure, which is going to go here, then to TFD, and then if we step to each waypoint, you can see where we're going from there. Sorry, my nose itched. <coughs> and if we want a broader view, we can zoom out and we can see we can step all the way through our waypoints. What's the purpose of this? Well, there's a couple things we do here. First of all, we want to make sure that we didn't accidentally choose some random waypoint that's 6,000 miles away from where we're actually going. Some of you have experienced that in the past where you look at a flight, uh, a flight plan that's been placed on a map and you have this one waypoint down in Africa but you're just flying across the US. It's because it has the same name and we chose the wrong one during that flight planning process. Now, without pulling up the plan mode here, we could just as easily take a look here and see how far apart our waypoints are just to get a general idea of whether or not we've chosen a waypoint that's in the wrong hemisphere. And as you can see, the farthest two are from SLN to BDF, and that's 392 nautical miles. So that allows us to check our flight plan, but it also allows us, and I use this quite a bit, if I'm not confident that I've chosen the right uh, departure for whatever reason, and, and again, I typically use actual charts to do that, but if for some reason I didn't use a chart, and I want to make sure that I'm choosing a departure that suits me, then I will go in here and I will see where those waypoints lay out. That being said, if I go back to departure arrival, let's zoom this out one more there. Choose my departure again. I'm still going to depart runway 3, but let's say I didn't like that Bernard departure. Let's say I want to see what FTHLS3 is. <laughs> I click on that, and you can see this here? This dotted line is the waypoints for that departure. That's what the dotted line is. The magenta line is what I'm currently using. Okay, if I zoom out a little further here, I can see that it doesn't even, that's probably vectors is what that is. That's why this line goes way off here, and then you've got BROAK. Let's go ahead and execute it and see what happens. So what is this? It's vectors. Let me show you what vectors look like here. See? Vectors. So all our waypoints are over here. It didn't get rid of Bernard, unfortunately. That's, that's one of the things uh, that I, I have a bit of an issue with. I have to delete that myself. And I'll talk about that in a second. But vectors on our navigation display are just a straight line that goes off into nowhere because the computer is assuming that ATC is going to tell us where they want us to go. Okay, so let's say we want to use this departure. We don't want vectors, so let's get rid of those the same way. Vectors are gone. Execute that. But you can see it's still got the waypoints from the Bernard 3 departure. Now, I like this departure better because... We're going up this way anyway, and it just takes us straight up there instead of going out over here. And just so you know, TFD is out by Phoenix, which is 30-some miles out of our way, essentially. All right. If I, if I just take Bernard and put it right here, then what's going to happen is I'm going to go from uh, Goodyear to Browack here, and then up to FTHLS, wherever that is up here. And then it's going to turn around and come back to Bernard, then go to TFD, and then continue on route. Well, that's a complete waste of fuel and a complete waste of time. And in fact, you can see that if we do that, it's going to use our reserve fuel. So how do we get rid of this? There's two ways we can do that. One, we can click the... Uh, first, let's clear this message out. We can click clear. And then I can click clear again. And actually, I'm sorry. I need to click delete. <coughs> Excuse me. A little frog in my throat there. If I click delete and then click Bernard, you can see that Bernard is gone now and it changed all of our lines here. We've got white lines again because we haven't executed that. So let's execute it. Now what happens is I still have a route discontinuity 
And if I connect TFD, I still have the same problem. It goes Broac, FTHL, I think that's supposed to be Foothills actually. So Broac, Foothills, and then it'll go back to TFD and then on a route still a waste of time. There's another way that we can get rid of those and a faster way. Let's say we had several waypoints in here and we wanted to get rid of them all at once. The easiest thing to do is go to the waypoint we want to come after Foothills, which in this case is SJN. All right, we're not going to use reserve fuel, don't worry. So I click next to SJN and put it down in the scratch pad, and then I put that in place of the last waypoint I want to get rid of. So put it in place of TFD, okay? Because uh, we want, I'm sorry, not the last, the first. If I had three or four of these here, I would want it to take the place of the first. By doing that, what I'm doing is I'm getting rid of all the waypoints between SJN and Foothills hit execute. Still have a route discontinuity because we never got rid of it. The easiest way to get rid of that of course is to click SJN again and put it in the boxes and now we've connected our route. Now I hope I didn't ramble on too long and I hope that makes some sense to everybody. It can be a little confusing sometimes uh, but once you get the hang of it it's really easy to use this FMC. Okay let's go ahead and put that back down there. Let's put uh, this guy back down there and let's hop down and let's finish up here. So we started out with our route page. We went to our uh, performance initialization and then our, um, our N1, and now we have to do our takeoff. You can see by clicking on the route button, it took us back to the first route page, but the next option is takeoff. That's because we've done everything else. So we go to our takeoff page, and you can see now that on this side, we have options for V speeds, V1, V rotate, and V2. What are these V speeds? I don't know if I've explained this before, so I'll do it really quick. V1 is the speed at which the aircraft can no longer stop and abort the takeoff on the runway. So based on, you, the speeds weren't there before because we hadn't chosen our departure runway. Now, based on our aircraft's weight and the performance we've chosen, when we reach 123 knots, we will no longer have enough runway left to stop if we need to abort a takeoff, which means we're committed at that point. V rotate, which is often pretty close to V1, especially in a 737, is the speed at which we're going to pull gently back on the yoke and bring the aircraft into the air. V2 is the minimum speed at which this aircraft can climb on one engine. Now in order to put these in here, all we have to do is press the buttons next to each one, and there we go. If we want to, we can turn QRH off. This is QRH. We can turn that off by simply clicking here and then they go away. Keep in mind, if you have that off and you've done everything to set up your flight, not only will you not see the numbers over here, but you can't you can't click the button to enter them in here. So keep that in mind as well. Can we change our V speeds? Well, let's see. If I type in 124 and click here, hey, look at that. I just changed V1 to 124. So if I want to alter my V speeds, I can do so. Let's say I want to play it safe and I want to make sure that my V2, or the minimum speed on which I can climb on one engine, is 135 knots. I can type in 135 and put it here, and that gives me a little safety margin if I have an emergency situation on takeoff. My center of gravity shouldn't have changed. My trim doesn't change. We're good to go there. Everything is set, believe it or not, for our departure. Now, if we click to the next page of the takeoff reference here, we can put in our runway wind. We said our wind was 038 slash, use the slash key here, six knots, and we can put that in there, and that, see, it, it deleted our takeoff speeds now. Why did it do that? Well, let's go back and take a look at our takeoff speeds really quick. See, they're not showing because we turned our QRH off, so we turn it back on. You can see they're lower now. Why? Because now the aircraft is making its calculations based on that headwind. Because we're going to have wind blowing in our face, our V1 is going to come at a slightly lower speed, our V rotate is going to come at the same speed, and then our V2 is the same speed. Okay, so it changes, get back in there, it changes based on that wind that we put in there, all right? So when we put our runway wind in there, it changed that. If we know the slope of the runway, we can put it in there. If we know the condition of the runway, we can change that. See, delete, every time you make a change, it's going to delete your takeoff speeds, all right? Uh, if the runway was wet, we'd want to put that in there because it changes all of that information on our takeoff speeds. Let's clear that out for a minute. These numbers right here, these are what we use for a derated takeoff, especially at an airport like John Wayne, where we have um, noise ordinance 
issues to deal with. So at John Wayne, when you're at 800 feet AGL, let's type that in, 800 AGL, that's our reduction height. That's where our throttles need to be reduced, okay? So we can reduce our throttles at 800 AGL, but keep our speed where it's at, which means the nose is going to come down, so the aircraft isn't going to climb as fast. And then our acceleration height is when the throttle should, um, should start back in, okay? Uh, I don't know what cutback means. I'll have to look that up in the manual. But um, if you do know, please throw it down in the comments. And you gotta, you gotta tell. I'm, whew, I'll tell you what. I'm just, I'm rambling on here because this, this is, this is just setting up the flight. That's all we've done so far. Is set up a flight. It's nothing else at this point. So let's go over a few other functions that are available on the FMC for ground functions really quick so that we understand a few more things. And I'm gonna wrap this up because this has already got to be like almost 30 minutes. So if we click our initial reference page at any time, it's going to take us back to that performance page now because we've already set the rest of that up. We could change our N1 limits if we wanted to still. Keep in mind that our V speeds were deleted, okay? And you can see that our V1 speed is much lower now. And then our V2 and our V rotator are the same. We want to put those back in there so that we get our call outs. Those are good to have. Let's talk about a few other things on the ground here really quick. Uh, let's talk about the index first. Anytime we see index here, we can just about anywhere you can find index. If you don't see it there, just hit the initial reference page and then click on index and you can see we've got identification. That's the aircraft we're in. This is where you can always check and make sure that your AIRAC cycle, your nav data AIRAC cycle is current and up to date. It even tells you when it expires. It gives you your engine rating and some other basic information about the aircraft. If we go to our position page, this is where we're at right now. We could even go ahead and put KGYR as the reference airport and because we're using a GPS which is pretty accurate we could put the gate in as well if we wanted. It gives us our current time in Zulu or GMT. Those are the same thing. If we go to the next page here we can see we've got more uh, position reference information. This is the FMC position reference. IRS left, IRS right, GPS left, GPS right. Those are all GPS coordinates essentially from different uh, um, I want to say trackers. They're not trackers, though. They're all from different sources. So the FMC source, the IRS, left and right, GPS, left and right. And you can see they're all pretty much the same within a little bit of a, a variance there. All right. Next page. Position shift. I've never messed with this. I don't know what this does. If you do, feel free to throw it in there. We can, sh we can choose nav status from here. And that gives us two pages. Uh, GPS, there's two of them. IRS, there's two of them. DMEs, uh, uh, left and right. Well, there's another page on this. DME update, we can turn it on or off. VOR updates on and off. GPS and localizer updates on and off. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Let's go back to the index real quick. Performance page, that's just going to take us back to our performance page. Takeoff page. Approach page. Now, this uh, once we're in the air, uh, if we hit initial reference, it's going to take us to the approach page every time. And this is where we choose the flaps that we want to land at. Okay. And it's going to give us the speed. So if I want to land full flaps 40 degrees, then I click on the button next to that. It populates it down here. And then I would click on the button next to flap speed. And it's going to put that in there for me. And then it's going to give me that reference speed on my speed tape over here when I'm ready to land so that I can... Uh, Set, set my uh, autopilot properly or if I'm hand flying it I, I've got a reference bug on there and what else we got here nav data we already took a look at uh, um, our air act cycle but this is uh, waypoint identifications nav aid identifications airport identifications we can go with a summary which isn't working right now navigation options we've already looked at those from another page you can see some of these uh, work together Alternate destinations, if we haven't put in alternate airports, we can put those in here. Um, if we're, if we have an emergency in air, we can go to this page, click on nearest airports, choose, w choose whatever airport's going to work for us, and then that'll become our alternate immediately. And on and on and on it goes. We're not gonna, we don't need to mess with maintenance, uh, and we're not going to mess with anything in configuration. This is, this is actually getting into functions that you can find in these options over here, so we're not going to mess with that either. Okay, we've gone through route. Let's look at our climb real quick. Our cruise altitude is set to flight level 380. We can change that. Let's say we wanted to change it to 360. 
type that in it's going to ask us to execute it if we don't want to simply click erase and what that's doing is that's calculating the speeds necessary to maintain what our cost index at 50 percent we can change our climb rate by choosing max rate of climb or max angle of climb you simply click on it it's going to come up uh, it's going to change these numbers up here if you want to do that you uh, if you want to go with that you press execute or we can always press erase and then if you have an engine out you can press that as well and then you choose which engine is out and it's going to change some information for you and it's going to get you see our max flight level is going to be flight level 194 which is 19,400 feet our target speed is 203 knots and so on and so on and on and on and on it goes we could do this for days literally um, we don't want to do left engine out let's go back here cruise same thing we can change this information you can change your target speed yourself if we want to do 0 0.80 instead of 792 we could do that let's say we're running a little behind we want to speed up vice versa if we wanted to slow down we could put in a lower speed as well uh, this will by doing that this tells us what our N1 is going to change to uh, and then it tells us uh, our fuel uh, with modification what our fuel at JFK will be and it shows that as 3.4 3400 now let's erase that real quick and let's just take a look if you press on your progress page you can see that at JFK our fuel is going to be 3600 pounds so if we made that modification we'd actually burn more fuel okay this shows us our next uh, um, well right now it's showing the runway and then uh, what it will show is uh, after we pass Broac, Broac would move up here we're going we'd be going from Broac to Foothills and then it gives us our fuel calculations and it's an ongoing fuel calculation we can look uh, we can add some information here. it's going to give us cross track errors it's going to give us current wind um, I'm still not 100% positive on RTA so I apologize for that uh, as well as RNP but this is all information if you need it in flight it's going to be available there to you looking at descent same thing probably the biggest thing on descent is you want to make sure that your speed restriction is put in here I always put it at 240 knots below 10,000 and that way if we get some gusty winds or something I'm not getting over speed warnings uh, because the VA that I fly for it tracks that and you get a, you get a warning flag if you will uh, if you fly above 200 it actually lets you go to 260 but I keep it around 240 we can click on our forecast um, and th there is no forecast in here <coughs> because the weather doesn't load automatically into the NGX. It does in the 777. If you use Active Sky Next, you can load it in there, um, but that doesn't work for the NGX. So just something to keep in mind as well. And I think that's about it, really, for ground operations. There's not much else to do here on the ground. Uh, issues like holds and fix and stuff like that are things we typically would do in the air. So I think that pretty much wraps up this extremely long tutorial for. FMC operations on the ground and as you can see the bulk of it obviously revolves around your flight planning and uh, setting up your uh, flight management computer for your takeoff parameters. So I hope that this was helpful to you. I apologize if it was a little long and a little rambly. Um, that wasn't my intent but I wanted to make sure we got all the information to you as best we could. All that being said I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did please give it a thumbs up down below. If there's something that I missed or got incorrect, please leave it in the comments. If there's something that you'd like to see that I didn't show, same thing. Please leave it in the comments and I'll, uh, I'll either do it in a new video or update this one later on. And last but not least, as always, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, fresh shout out to my newest subscribers. I never, I never say them by name because I don't have anybody's permission for that. <coughs> But uh, we got quite a few on there now. We're up to uh, over 50 subscribers, and that just excites me to no end. So love to see that number keep climbing. I appreciate your guys' support. And uh, as always, I'm Captain Mac, and keep the blue side up unless otherwise instructed by ATC or if it's a cloudy day. You folks have a great day.